Greetings fans of early 70s rock, particularly that which comes from the Great White North. This is Peter Sko for Music is a Journey and today I want to talk about some of the albums I picked up over the summer by bands uh, from Canada who released albums in the early part of the 1970s. Now I did do a video previously a couple of years back about hard rock or heavy rock from Canada in the 70s. These are mostly new albums I want to talk about, except for the very first album. The very first album I want to talk about is Warpig. Warpig's self-titled album, which was released probably 1971. Now here's the interesting thing. While trying to gather information about this on the internet, there wasn't anything particularly clear. I got information saying that the album was recorded as early as 1969, others saying it was recorded in 1970, some website said that it was released in 70, one website for the band description said it was released in 1970, and then for the album description said it was released in 1972. An American album collector held up a piece of vinyl, an original that was from 1972, so the information is all over the place. Now before we get into some of the details about that, let's just do a brief overview of the band. We're looking at uh, a band that formed in Woodstock, Ontario. And the information I got from Citizen Kane website said that the band members actually gathered around 1966 and became Warpig in 67 or 68. And um, from there on, they continued throughout the early half of the 70s, but eventually disbanded due to difficulties in getting a second album released, uh, lack of support, lack of good management, and so on. Now, the band actually consisted of uh, Rick Don Moyer on vocals and guitars, Dana Snitch on keyboards and vocals, Terry Hook percussion, drums, and Terry Brett on bass. Now, one of the things about this album, yes, actually, I, I gotta say, this is one of Canada's heaviest albums from the early 70s. I'd say this one, along with Dionysus' uh, Le Grand Jeu, um, these were probably the two of the heaviest albums to come out of Canada. Warpig, I think their sound can best be described as something very close to Uriah Heep or Deep Purple. Uh, the website, let's see here, the Citizen Kane website, described it as early heavy metal, heavy rock, hard rock, acid rock, psychedelic rock, and progressive rock. Probably that was not just Citizen Kane. Now, what's very interesting here is that there are a couple of moments on here, first of all, where the vocal style is really like early Uriah Heep with that very high vibrato vocals. They come in at least twice, if not more, on this album here, and it sounds very much Uriah Heep inspired. However, we have to remember that Uriah Heep released their debut album, Very Heavy, Very Humble, in 1970. I forget the exact month. So it would be interesting to know if this band actually tried to do the same vocal style because they heard it on Uriah Heep's album, or if they hadn't already done this on their own, or perhaps had some other inspiration. More importantly, though, is the song Rockstar. Now, in that previous video I made about hard rock and heavy rock in Canada in the 70s, I talked about the song Rockstar. But I've listened to it again more recently, and I find there are three interesting points. First of all, the most obvious point is that the rhythm, the rhythm, uh, sorry, the rhythm, the, the verse part of the song sounds remarkably like Deep Purple's Fireball. It's as if Fireball is just a faster, more intense version, but basically the same thing. And this has led to a lot of people on the internet proposing, either on websites or videos, listing songs that have been plagiarized, uh, to use the strictest of terms, by Deep Purple. And most of the songs are not rock songs, but this one, Rockstar, always gets listed. And it's kind of a mystery how it would be that Deep Purple would have picked up on this song. The only explanation could be that they were touring in the Hamilton area, or Toronto area anyway, of Canada around 6970 and heard War Pig performing live and picked up on that song. I mean, Richie Blackmore, I know he went to concerts of local bands just to hear what local bands were doing um, to get some possible ideas. So it could be that that's where the origin of that connection is. But it's not just the Fireball connection. There is some... Um, 
at least twice on the album where the guitar does uh, something that's very similar to what Richie Black Blackmore did on the Deep Purple in Rock album. As well, uh, there is a riff that comes in, I think, after the solo, but possibly before and after, um, which sounds like something from Speed King. And then, near the end, there's a bit of a drum solo bit, um, not so advanced, but it sounds like the beginning of the drum part in Flight of the Rat from In Rock. So there are, I find, at least four different points on one song that really sound like Deep Purple. Now, if this song had been released in 1972 and possibly recorded in 71, I could see how Warpig would have heard In Rock and heard Deep Purple's Fireball album and then decided, hey, let's do a, a Deep Purple inspired song. However, um, as I said, there's discrepancy on the internet when the song was originally written, when it was recorded, when the album was released. And there's this kind of shifting gray area where what came before in rock, what came after in rock, and what came before Fireball. So anyway, um, while I was trying to figure information out about this, I happened to notice that Warpig had a Facebook page. And if they have a Facebook page, it probably means you can send them a message. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and when you know it, Rick Don Moyer actually responded to my email. So um, rather than read out our exact dialogue, what I want to do is read out his answers to my questions. All right, so let's, let's, I'll put some pictures up while I read, okay? <laughs> I will answer as best as I can. Surviving band members have often differed in their personal memories of dates and events because most of the band business was handled by a variety of managers, many inept or less than straight with us. So all of the actual dated records were never in any band members' hands. We wanted to write, record, perform, and party, not deal with the seemingly mundane tasks of anything business-related. This made us perfect targets for anyone with questionable intentions. I think the album was recorded starting as early as 1970, but have nothing here on paper to prove that. I recall the studio, its location, some elements of specific sessions, the engineer Ken Friesen, we first met at Sound Canada Studio on the first session. The producer in name, band manager Robert Thomas. The not-so-up-and-up managers who bought our contract from him, James Crotu and Robert Irving. The engineer, Terry Brown, who recorded the second versions of Rockstar and Flag It for London Records. And the first album re-release in 1973. Okay, Rockstar. As with many of our songs, I think it was generated out of our regular jam rehearsal writing sessions. We spent time in our small rehearsal space almost every day, and when we were not playing gigs or specifically rehearsing sets for them, one or the other of us would be ready to go before the others, and have either brought some idea with us or just started noodling on our individual instrument, and one or more of the other band members would quickly jump in and begin playing along in some fashion. This led to everyone joining in and the songs took shape quickly. Stops and starts occurred as we dropped ideas for the budding song, bridges, riffs, tempo changes, etc. seemed to generate out of the collaboration of this group of four diverse people and the blending, collisions, inadvertent errors that became new directions drove us forward, time after time. Some songs arrived with one or more of us and had some structure scrawled on paper. Often lyrics were born of thought someone wrote down and dropped on the pile of notes, many of which I still have here and draw from when trying to recall some never recorded songs. As I recall, Rockstar began with drummer Terry Hook, Ace, working out on some idea in his head before we even got things started that day. We were set up in a retired barber shop, a tiny outbuilding a local retired barber had built on his property in Beachville the village where bassist Terry Brett lived. Ace was playing away furiously on his own, and as we arrived and plugged in and tuned up, uh, so one started playing the riff and the chords and the song was built on. Everything developed over the next couple of hours, including lyrics that are an approximate storied rendition of an encounter involving girls, hotel beds, 
an ice machine, members of another band playing at a different stage in the same venue, who were staying in the same hotel, and a variety of shared refreshments. Memories of that time are vague, but the missing story parts were made up to rhyme and to fit with the song story itself. Imagination is a wonderful thing. The two versions of Rockstar are quite different, sharing much, but also songs of differing lengths, intros, and endings. They sound different from a recording standpoint, having been recorded in different studios with different engineers and different management executive producers and at a different point in the band's ever-changing existence. We were catering to management insistence that we shorten the song, change the intro and ending that more suited AM radio and have something that could attach Terry Brown's name, Rush's engineer, producer for many albums, to our album when it came out on London Records label with new cover art, notes, etc. So at this point I asked, was the band a fan of Deep Purple and Uriah Heep? Wondering if maybe some kind of influence had come in that way? Rick said, yes, we are all big fans of Deep Purple, Uriah Heep and numerous Brit rock bands, them, Pretty Things, The Who, you name them, we loved them. So then I asked Rick, what did you think when you heard Deep Purple's Fireball come out? Uh, did you feel anything like it was similar to your song Rockstar? I don't think any of us thought anything about Deep Purple and their songs except reverence and how much we love them. Brothers in music across the pond. We met everyone except Richie in London, Ontario back then, but it was fleeting and surrounded by fans. John Bonham and Ian Pace are probably still Ace's fave drummers on the planet. I actually have never heard the reissue, the re, the new version of Rockstar that was recorded for the London Records release. So Rick actually sent me a file of that to listen to, along with this explanation. The London Records version with recent EQ fix and normalization by me to the released track. It was too muddy and misrepresented the bass, drums versus other stuff balance. I can't totally fix it, but this is much closer to what happened in the studio. Mastering was considered unimportant back then and assigned to helpers and had a set formula that was supposed to be the standard for everything from folk to symphonic music and has now been recognized as its own skill and art form. I do not have the original master, so had to create my own from a vinyl transfer. So uh, anyway, in the end, I don't think I really found out exactly which came first and how much of Rockstar was inspired by Deep Purple or how much of Rockstar inspired Richie Blackmore. Who knows? But anyway, I kind of like that the mystery is not totally settled and I'm really grateful for Rick Don Moyer to take out so much time of his morning when he actually had a busy day ahead of him to sit there and answer all my questions on Facebook Messenger. Anyway, if you are one of those few people out there who love early 70s hard rock that have not heard this album, that's to say that there are plenty of people who love early 70s hard rock, but maybe few who might not have heard this album, you should check out Warpig's album. This is not the original album cover. I don't have the original album cover. I'll put it here. There you go. And by the way, just a few final words from Rick. We ain't done yet. There is more music and some of it is getting closer to being ready to be heard out there. We have no record label currently and lack the media savvy to release, press, distribute and promote our own music, but there are several song tracks in various states of completion that we recorded together both back in the 70s and then since 2004 when we really got to know each other again and spent time here writing and recording in my Stony Creek studio. So, let's hope that we actually do finally get to hear some recordings by Warpig. They did have an album's worth of songs that never got released. I would really love to hear those. And if they have some new stuff to put on as well, hey, bring out another Warpig CD. I'm ready. All right, let's move along now to see what are some of the new old CDs that I picked up. Well, this is an album by a band called Christmas. This is their second album, Heritage. Both of their albums were released in 1970. Little bit of background information on the band. The band was formed by Bob Bryden, who was formerly in a band called Rain Ghost, who released two albums at the end of the 60s. 
The female vocalist Linda Squires left to join the hair ensemble, so Bryden wanted to make a really serious psych band. The band was formed on Christmas Day 1969, hence the name Christmas. However, originally the band name, according to the Citizen Freak website, was going to be a lot longer. It was going to be the Society for the Year-Round Preservation of the Spirit of Christmas. Thank goodness they just shortened it to Christmas, although that is a bit puzzling, isn't it? I'm listening to Christmas music. The band actually did record those two albums and then split up, but a year later they got back together under the name of Spirit of Christmas and released a third album, which is actually listed on the Prague archives and gets some pretty fairly decent comments about it. Um, the Christmas albums are not on Prague archives. The first album was apparently supposed to be 12 anonymous cover songs. However, once the band members got together and started jamming, they realized doing cover songs was not what they were meant to do. They began preparing their own material and, as I said, managed to release two albums in 1970. The first one, I've only heard snippets of it, but I can tell you this, the second one sounded good enough that I had to get it. The band members were all very young, by the way. Bob Bryden, who is who was uh, guitars and vocals, was the oldest at 19. Robert Bulger, 18 years old, guitars. Tyler Raisin, I guess, bass and 16 years old. And drummer Richard Richter was also 16. The music here is described as heavy, but we're not talking about like Black Sabbath heavy or Deep Purple in rock aggressive, but it is some pretty heavy psychedelic music. Now, this is what I would consider the latter half of psychedelic music. There was a sound change going from mostly 1969, the kind of more fuzz-toned, buzzing guitar sounds of 67, 68, and early 69 psychedelic rock was being replaced for this more overdrive distortion sound. For example, what you would hear on Led Zeppelin's debut or Black Sabbath or um, Mountain, uh, Grand Funk Railroad, that kind of thing. The interesting thing is that the songs are, many of them are actually quite complex. There are a couple of tracks on here that run over 10 minutes and go through different parts. So there is that very serious side, which they said at the time they were trying to create a really serious psych band, but we can feel that the the movement towards progressive rock is there. They are expanding on their song structures, changing tempos, changing rhythms, and uh, yeah, changing moods within the tracks. If there's one thing to say against it, it's that this is a band that doesn't have a real vocalist. They have four talented musicians and a person who is more adept at singing than the others, but they don't have what I would consider a real singer. You know, like a lot of bands, you get like your Robert Plant and your Ian Gillen and your Ozzy Osbourne and so on. They are meant to be the vocalists of the band. Now, of course, you've got plenty of bands like uh, Jack Bruce of Cream and Jimi Hendrix in his bands and Geddy Lee and Rush and so on, who are both singers and musicians. I don't feel that the lead vocalist on here has that same vocal talent or ability. But other than that, this is, is quite a pleasing album. So that's Christmas Heritage from 1970. This next band, a little bit hard to see because it's in plastic. This is Steel River and their album Way and Heavy, also from 1970. Steel River was a band uh, comprised of John Dudgeon on vocals, R Bob Forrester keyboards, Rob Cockill bass, Tony Dunning guitar, and Ray Angrove on drums. They first formed in 1965 as the as Toronto Shotgun. However, in 1969, they decided to be a full-time band and began writing their own material. They got signed to, to the Tuesday record label by Greg Hamilton. Um, Greg Hamilton, by the way, later on did Axe Records, and you can still find Axe Records and Greg Hamilton on the website, and you can buy albums released by Axe Records on that website. Um, the band did a cover of a song called Ten Pound Note, which actually became a top 10 hit in Canada at the time, uh, in 1969 when it was released as a single. Way and Heavy was released as a full-length album after that, and they recorded A Better Road, their follow-up album in 1971. However, 
it was hard for them to move forward. I think, again, the usual deal, you can't really get label support or there's some changes in management, and in the end, the band gets frustrated and they split up. So in 1974, they split up. However, most of the original members, I think all but one, regrouped, and they released a third album in 1980 called Armored Car, but the album quickly tanked. Now, you can get all three albums through Axe Records. This here actually is from the uh, Big Pink label out of South Korea. I only found out about the Axe Records release after I had ordered this. This one here is fine, but I do think Big Pink is doing vinyl transfers. I don't think they're doing uh, anything from Masters. Other albums I have from Axe Records, the, the sound is really clean, and I'm pretty sure Greg Hamilton is keeping the masters from those early recording sessions and he is reissuing the CDs using those. Whereas Big Pink in South Korea, I'm pretty sure it's not original master tapes. So I have been told by someone on the internet, on, on Facebook, that he has both this one and the Axe Records one and the sound quality is better on Axe Records. I like this album. Uh, there are three or four tracks on here that I really enjoy. Um, but I'm not quite sure if I want to spend the money to buy it again just to get slightly better sound quality. I might. But anyway, this is Steel River, way and heavy. They are not a heavy rock or proto metal band. They are a rock band that play a little bit on the heavy side. I mean, they've got the lower tones. They've got the Hammond organ, they've got the guitars, but they're not like, you know, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Uriah Heap kind of thing. But still, it is a pretty solid album with some good tracks on there. So next up we have Jericho. There was actually also an Israeli band called Jericho who, who released three albums under different names, The Churchills, Jericho Jones, and then Jericho. And actually in Canada, there was also an artist going by the name of Jericho Jones who released a single. But anyway, this is Canada's band, Jericho, <laughs> and they released one album in 1971. I really couldn't find much information about them. They were listed on Citizen Freak with limited information and another site called Kanakistan Music. I couldn't find them listed on there at all. But what I have is that uh, this album is from 1971. The band consisted of Fred Keeler, lead guitar vocals, Danny Gerard, bass vocals, Gord Fleming, piano organ vocals, Frank De Felice, drums, and the sound of the band is described as blues rock, country rock, a bit of psychedelic. It's true, this is pretty much what you'd expect. It, it does have a lot of country rock, southern rock feel to it. In fact, there is one song called Go Into the Country, which exactly has um, a very intentional country sound to it. Um, there are some good songs on here, though, and the one that, uh, a couple that really surprised me is their blues-type songs here. I've, I've heard so many blues rock songs from the 60s, 70s, and, and even, you know, from like Gary Moore and so on later on, some of the w former White Snake members, whatever. There's so much blues rock out there that I don't specifically seek it out because I've just heard so much of it. But I was pleasantly surprised by the blues rock tracks on this album here. They do a spankingly good job of it and could almost sound like um, an alternate version of Deep Purple doing one of their blues rock numbers. So Jericho um, has some pretty good stuff on it. Also the big pink label. So again, probably a vinyl transfer, but I don't see this CD available anywhere else. So, you know, at least as I mentioned in the video about rock candy, you've got these different boutique labels out there re-releasing really hard to get stuff. And sometimes they don't have the masters. They're just going with whatever's available. Usually it's just a really good, clean piece of vinyl. But anyway, Jericho. I don't even remember how I found this. <laughs> this is a band called Amish. They were from Galt, Ontario. And just outside Galt, Ontario is an Amish community. And apparently the band members, or at least one of them, was very much inspired by their clean way of living, their fresh way of living. And Amish wanted to create music that kind of reflected a kind of clean and fresh sound. However, what they are basically is a hard rock band with fuzz tone guitar, Hammond organ, very powerful, soulful vocals with a bit of a gruff edge to it, um, and a pretty solid hard rock album. So I'm not exactly sure how Amish fits in there. There is a nude woman on the back of uh, a large, maybe lioness. Uh, there is some strange beastly werewolf or some kind of dog-like thing here. There is a face on the moon. 
I don't know exactly how the Amish bit is supposed to connect. <laughs> Maybe it's just all in their minds. The band is comprised of, or was comprised of, Ron Baumtrog, keyboards, Doug Stagg, vocals, Richard Botts, guitar, Mike Gingrich, bass, and Jack Byrne on drums. After the release of their first album, they merged together with another Galt, Toronto area, uh, Galt, Ontario band called Oasis. And uh, there was some change in the members, a couple of members left Amish and some new members came in. A second album was recorded, but never released. Whoa, well, isn't that a story we're hearing over and over again? They became a four-piece band after, I think, the keyboard player left, and then they finally split up in 1974. The magic year for Canadian rock bands to split up, it seems. Um, interesting point here, the bass player Mike Gingrich would later on play in Night Winds, a symphonic prog band out of Toronto. Also, uh, he was Klaatu's touring bassist in the early 80s. He played with Headpins, a hard rock band out of Vancouver, and then also played in the band Toronto, um, a kind of more pop rock band, pop rock, anyway, not quite hard rock, but close, band out of Toronto. All right, and this album was reissued by Second Harvest in 2007. I got a hold of it through Rockadome, Rockadrome Records website. So there you go, Amish, a hard rock, heavy rock band, 1972. Pretty decent album, actually. Some good stuff. It does also go into some little proggy flourishes here where the keyboards or uh, piano or organ is used to kind of lighten and change the mood and the guitar goes clean for a bit, but then goes back to the kind of more hard rock inside. So anyway, if you, you can find it on YouTube, you can check it out there. So I haven't really talked about this one yet, although I did mention it before. This is Borealis and their one album, Sons of the Deep. They are from St. John's, Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador. The album is from 1973. The band was formed by Paul and Mark Bradbury, with uh, Paul being organ vocals and Mark being bass and vocals. They had Wayne Sturge on lead guitar and Dave Hillier was the drummer on all of the recordings. Uh, the, before recording, they actually had a previous drummer as well. The first album is known to be the first rock album recorded in the Atlantic provinces of Canada, and it is also the first album released by uh, a, a band out of Newfoundland. So they have that going for them. The album itself, it is, again, guitar, organ, drums, bass, vocals. Honestly, I've listened to it maybe only a couple of times, and there are parts of songs that I think, oh, that sounds pretty cool, but there hasn't yet been a song on the album that really gets my attention. You know, the other albums I've talked about so far, I can pick out two or three songs at least that say, yes, I've been playing those ones over a few times, they're really cool. Haven't really picked up on something from this one yet, but knowing that it is the first rock band from Newfoundland to record an album. <laughs> it's kind of a historic thing in that way. This here is a, a pirated reissue, apparently, uh, out of South Korea. Again, South Korea doing a nice job of picking up obscure Canadian releases and releasing them. Um, this also comes with a second album that was recorded under a completely different project name. It was... Um, so, um, Paul Bradbury and the Borealis members, uh, Paul Bradbury wrote music for a children's play that was called Professor Fuddle's Fantastic Fairy Tale Machine. And the children's play was supposed to explain to children how computers work. And apparently, um, it was shown, uh, performed Christmas 1973 and got very good reviews. I don't know, I haven't seen it. <laughs> that is a very puzzling thing, though, because it does have that children's, aimed at children type song structure. If you've ever heard Ian Gillen's Cher Kazoo and other stories, a little bit like that, a little bit. Anyway, that's Borealis from Newfoundland. I'm going to have to listen to this again. I'm sure there's got to be at least a couple of songs on here that'll make me go, yeah, that's that's got to go on a compilation. All right, next up, this is Moonquake, a band out of Montreal. They recorded two albums. This one here is self-titled, originally released in 1972, and then re-released in 73 with this artwork on the cover. It is like a 
moon face type thing with a little kind of like a space probe or you know stuck in the ear with a Canadian flag on it <laughs> it's pretty funny anyway uh, they also released a second album in 1974 which was called Starstruck um, I, f I heard bits of it on YouTube I prefer this one anyway so let's see here we've got Jack August on bass and lead vocals Hovannis Hagopian, acoustic and electric guitar, electric sitar, synthesizer and vocals, and Derek Kendrick, percussion drums. And there were four engineers involved in making this album. Terry Brown was one of them. So um, that's pretty much all I can find about Moonquake. But let me tell you about the album here. This, okay. Think about Nazareth in the 1970s, and you know they had some pretty solid hard-rocking songs, you know they also had some really heavy songs, but they also had kind of more like country rock styled songs, they had some more folk style, they had lots of other stuff in there. They're known more for their hard rock, heavy rock stuff, but they had lots of other stuff. If you take the hard rock and heavy rock out, what's left is quite similar to this. There are some songs on here I can almost imagine change the vocals a bit to Dan McCafferty and it's a Nazareth song. <laughs> now, it's not just Nazareth. It's not like this, pan, this band was totally influenced by, what, 1972 originally, right? So at that time, Nazareth had only released one or two albums. Okay, so they're not a Nazareth ripoff. They just have some similarities. Also, the first song, uh, Remember When... I feel the chorus actually has almost like an early Blue Oyster Cold chorus sound to it. Uh, there's another kind of countryfied, slower rock song that reminds me a lot of Blue Rodeo later on from the 1990s. Um, and there were a couple of other moments in here that I also thought of other bands. It's quite a diverse album. We've got a very cool rock song with a bit of a psychedelic feel to it. We've got this kind of more countryfied rock or ballad type things. We have a blues track and the album closes with a medley uh, 10 minutes long which actually is several short songs stitched together and again showing the band's range of sound although there is actually one part where it does get a little more into the heavy groove stuff which is pretty cool. As far as heaviness goes it's probably the most interesting part of the album. However I actually find myself liking some of the lighter songs and I'm quite surprised. I think it's because I actually had a time in my life where I was doing deliveries for a company and I had only AM radio and I didn't want to listen to Top 40 Pop, so I listened to country music and I actually found some of the songs I enjoyed listening to, like lyrically and just basically music overall, I enjoyed them. So I'm picking up on that a little bit here. I find that the lyrics are telling a story very nicely. Um, so, you know, if I had given a good listen to this for the sake of just deciding whether I liked it or not, I might not have got it. But because it was available, it's an early 70s Canadian rock album, and a couple of the songs I heard did catch my attention, they were agreeable to me, I got it. And actually one thing I really want to point out about this album is the sound quality is super good. You know, like some of these albums I said, they're probably vinyl transfers, there's a bit of a scratchiness to them, not really bad, you know, but it just feels like you're listening to an early 70s album. This is so clean. The sound is so good. I, I guess the original tapes must have been used and the remastering whatever stage they did that at, it's just someone who really knew what he's doing. Like, I think I enjoy listening to this album even more than I normally would just because the sound is so darn good. So that's Moonquake, their self-titled album from 72, 73. Right, we're going to start wrapping this up here pretty soon, but I got to mention this one here. This, okay, imagine what a band who was influenced by Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd, the Stooges, the Velvet Underground, and the Kraut Rock Band can. Imagine what a band with those kind of influences would sound like. If you want to know, you should check out Simply Saucer. <laughs> Simply Saucer were that kind of band. They had a mixture of those different kind of styles. In the beginning, there were about six members, including someone who played violin um, quite furiously on stage, apparently. But by the time they got into the recording studio to record some songs, they were a four-piece band. So we've got Edgar Bro, Bro, Bro. Uh, he is the kind of the main dude in the band and still leading the band today. 
uh, Kevin Kristoff, Neil De Merchant, and John LaPlante. I didn't find out who's doing what, although I think Edgar's playing the guitars. Uh, we've got guitar, bass, drums, violin, I'm not sure if that's actually included on here though, and theremin, which you definitely can hear on here. So here we've got this band that sounds like Stooges and Can and, and Pink Floyd and all that with theremin playing. It is really excessive, lots of distortion on the guitars. It It's off the rails sometimes. The studio tracks are all pretty killer. And then there are two live tracks that were actually recorded during a performance at the top of a shopping mall in Hamilton on the same day that Pink Floyd was actually playing in town, which is pretty neat. That recording actually is from June 28th, 1975. The studio recordings are also from 75, um, a little bit before then. The band went through, um, the, they couldn't get a label in Canada interested in releasing their stuff. The American labels were also not so thrilled about it. The band actually went through some lineup changes. By the time they hit their third stage, they went ahead to record a, a single with a B-side. They actually did some more live recordings and then all hell broke loose. Um, I got here some, let's see, there was a disastrous end with drugs, fights, someone cheating on with someone else's girlfriend. And, and and ended up with a shotgun suicide by someone. The band collapsed. But um, in the late 1980s, there was a kind of revived interest in this. And so it was released in 1989 on CD. And it just got picked up like one of the classic Canadian albums that you've never heard about. It actually ended up as number 36 on a list of 100 best Canadian albums of all time. <laughs> for an album that was never actually released until like 14 years later. And in 2002, I think it was, Sonic Union re-released the album again, remixed, remastered it, um, improved the sound quality, re-released all the tracks that are on this one here, plus the single and B-side and some other live tracks. Now, some of the reviews I've read is that the, the band are in their full force here on these original 1975 tracks. Um, not everything from later on sounds as intense or as ballsy. So I don't know about that. I got the 1989 one simply because it was less than a third of the price to get it used in decent condition than for me to buy a new copy uh, and as well pay for shipping from overseas. I picked up this in Japan, which is where I live. Um, I would have had to order an overseas copy from Europe and pay for shipping as well if I wanted the Sonic Union version. Um, this, I actually, surprisingly, I really like it. It's It's just so insane and so wild and so purposeful, uh, I find that I really enjoy it. And one interesting point is before one of the songs on here perform live, um, I guess it's Edgar Bro. he says that they're going to play some heavy metalloid music, <laughs> which is kind of neat. It's 1975. But the song is actually about the future where you cannot go out into the streets legally unless you have a metal body. So heavy metalloid music, Probably they were playing on the word heavy metal, but talking about the theme of their song. Right, so the last album I want to mention, this is actually outside of the late 70s. This is from 1976, although it actually was only released a few years ago. This is Thundermug's fourth and final album. Thundermug actually formed in the early 70s, and they released three albums in 72, 73, and 74, one each year, of course, and featured Bill Durst on guitar, Ed Pranksus, Pranskus on drums, Jim Corbett bass, and Joe, De Joe DeAngelis on vocals. Now, Joe's voice is just fantastic. He has a hard rock voice that is more suitable to the 80s than the early 70s. He's just like 10 years ahead of his time. He was brilliant, but he left the band because, you know, they were, by the third album, they were still not really achieving big time success. And the remaining, rem remaining members recorded one more album, which never got released, but it was in the Axe Records uh, vault for ages. And finally, Greg Hamilton started re-releasing a lot of this stuff that he had on the Axe Records vault there, um, re-releasing them. He re-released the all three Thundermug, uh, Thundermug albums there, and then he released this one here not that long ago. So very simple cover. It's just the three members. It says Bill, Jim, and Ed. <laughs> That's all you got. Um, Bill Durst takes over lead vocals. His vocal style is really different from Joe Dandelish. He's got a more typical lower rock voice, not like that really um, 
raw throat hard rock sound that Joe DeAngelis did. But still, this album is the Thundermug music sound. It is hard rock. It is heavy rock. It is sometimes bluesy, sometimes a bit southern, but for the most part, they're a pretty solid hard rock band with some heavier stuff. And I've got to say, the song Straight Up Standing Member of Society is just so catchy <laughs> that even after hearing it only once, it was going through my head during that day, and I've probably listened to it a few times now since then, and I only got this album a couple of days ago. But anyway, there you go. You can check out all of Thundermug Thundermug's albums on the Axe Records website. And that's what I want to say about some of these albums here I picked up from the early 1970s. Later on, we're going to take a look at some late 1970s albums from Canada. As well, I have an idea to talk about some prog albums out of Quebec, and I've got a few other video ideas. But probably the next one is going to be featuring another new release, not a Canadian band. But anyway, I hear by the voices downstairs, it's time for me to get moving. Thanks for watching this video, and see you in the next one. Bye.